Welcome back to Columbia Physics Preceptor Television. Today we'll be talking about the hydrogen atom. I want you to imagine for a few moments that you're a physicist in the early 1900s. Most of the classical problems of the day have been solved, but there are a few physical problems that are still slightly curious. One of them is the model of the atom. At this point, uh, it's already come out that the nucleus of the atom is very, very small and that the electrons seem to orbit around the atom. But you know, according to classical physics and class classical electromagnetism, that uh, since that electron is circling the atom, constantly accelerating, according to this model, it should also be losing energy. And as the electron loses energy, it spirals into the center of the atom, the atom becomes neutral and disintegrates. Now this is a problem for everyone in the room, since if this were the case, we would all disintegrate in oh, a few microseconds. But there was a man named Niels Bohr. Uh, he came out with a model of the atom that was based on some new data of the day. Uh, he looked at particularly spectral lines from different elements. Uh, scientists of the day were taking very pure elemental samples, heating them up over a flame, and then looking at the light that they emitted. This light always seemed to not be in a, in a clear spectrum, like say, uh, the light coming in from the sun. When you pass it through a prism, it makes a very wide range of colors, uh, a continuous rainbow. That you could think of, you know, if, if this is the wavelength of the light lambda, and the intensity, there would be some broad distribution of colors. However, when scientists heated up these very pure elements, they noticed that they didn't get a broad spectrum of colors. They got a few very distinct lines. A whole lot of light at one certain wavelength, and another wavelength, and another. And this was very puzzling to them. Different scientists, using a technique called spectroscopy, measured the wavelengths of this light. And this is what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be measuring the spectrum of hydrogen to try to confirm Niels Bohr's model of the atom, where all the electrons are in different discrete quantized states. This was uh, one of the founding models of quantum mechanics, and we're going to see it in action today. It turns out that if you have an atom, a hydrogen atom with one proton at the center, and an electron kind of going around the outside, Bohr's model of the atom said that this electron could only exist in discrete energy states. That's if we plot energy for the electron. The electron can only exist in certain small, or in certain energy states, and that the wavelengths of the light produced by the electron, or by the atom as it's heated up, correspond to jumps up and down among these energy levels. Uh, actually, one of the first people to analyze the wavelengths of hydrogen and kind of the reciprocal of the wavelength of the light to a constant times what he knew only to be some numerical factors. Today, we know it as the Rydberg formula and it contains the Rydberg constant, R. The Rydberg formula basically relates the number of the state of the electron, so n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, where a higher number corresponds to a higher energy. If the state starts out, in a, if the electron starts out in a state ni, and then jumps down to a state nf, it will emit a photon of length or of wavelength 1 over lambda given by this formula where you can plug in n equals 2 for ni or n equals 1 for nf if say the electron is jumping from the second state to the first state hydrogen for example emits visible light when electrons fall down into the n equals 2 state this is what we're going to be looking at today to do this we're going to be using an object called or an apparatus called a spectrometer and we'd like to confirm Rydberg's formula. You'll be measuring a number of wavelengths of the light and then trying to see 
if you plug in n equals 2, or nf equals 2 into Rydberg's formula, if all of your ni's will end up being integers. So how does a spectrometer work? As I mentioned before, scientists back in the early 1900s would use heated up elements. Today we'll be using an electrical discharge lamp only because this gives us a purer form of light and is easier to use, no open flames. With an electrical discharge lamp, you'll simply have a tube of hydrogen or in the calibration step, helium. This will emit a light into your spectrometer. It'll be collimated or focused into a very narrow beam through this telescope here. Then the light will hit what's called a diffraction grating. You may remember from the past lab that when light passes through uh, a very small slit or a very small opening in a screen, that it gets bent due to diffraction. A diffraction grating is just a small glass, a small pane of glass with many tiny little etchings on it. These etchings bend the light that goes through it. So you'll, so some of the light coming in, some will pass straight through. That's your first maximum, or the first uh, constructive, or first example of constructive interference of light. The next one will be out a certain angle theta away, say theta one. You'll then have another maximum at an angle n equals, or at an angle n, or theta two, so on and so forth. And the relationship for these angles theta to what's called the order of the maximum, either one, two, three, so on and so forth, is given by the expression d sine theta equals m lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of the light, m is the order of the maximum, theta is the angle, or the, the angle, angular deflection as the light passes through the diffraction grating, and d is the tiny spacing between the little etchings on the diffraction grating. Now the manufacturer gives a number for d, but we're not necessarily going to trust the manufacturer. There are variations in uh, the diff different diffraction gratings in this room, so you're going to use a helium lamp with a known value of lambda to get a good value for d. <clears throat> then we're going to use that value of d and use it to study hydrogen. How to use the spectrometer after here? So we know that this diffraction grating is bending light and sending it in different directions out over the table of the spectrometer. What you're going to do is take this second telescope right here and turn it around a different, or different angles and try to observe where these maxima occur for different colors of light. You'll notice that all the light coming straight through is a combination of these spectral lines, a combination of these colors, so you won't be able to pick out individual colors. But as you rotate the telescope out, you'll notice that the different colors are split up by the diffraction grating. The diffraction grating, uh, the deflection, depends on lambda. So wavelengths with different lambda will bend out at different angles. You want to measure what those angles are so that you can measure the wavelengths and see if you can plug those back into Rydberg's formula and get integers for ni, or the initial state of the electron before it jumps. Now one of the difficult things about using the spectrometer is using its scale. We can actually make very, very precise measurements with this spectrometer, up to five decimal places. But in order to do that, we need something more precise than just a simple protractor that gives us values in degrees. We'd like to get down to fractions of a degree. In order to use that, we're going to use something called a vernier scale. A vernier scale can be rather intimidating at first, but actually its use is simple after a little bit of practice. If you look around the edge of your spectrometer, you'll see a small window with an angular scale with markings every, I believe it's a quarter of a degree, and then below it, a small zero, and then 30 smaller lines. 
what you want to do is match up, <clears throat> is first start by finding the angle to the nearest whole or quarter, quarter of a degree. If, for instance, this is 20 degrees, this would be 21 degrees, pardon me, this would be 21 degrees, this would be 22 degrees, obviously this drawing is not to scale. What you want to do is first find where the zero lands on this larger, more coarse scale. Here, it's, 20, it's just past 20 degrees. So you'll start by adding 20 degrees to your measurement. In the end, we're going to have a sum of small angles that will give us a final answer for our angular uh, measurement. If this zero were slightly to the right of this line, that would be 20 plus a quarter degrees. In fact, let's use that as an example. It can be a little bit more illuminating. So here, the zero is just to the right, just to the right of the quarter degree. So we're going to want to do 20 plus a quarter of a degree. Now, fractions of degrees are a little bit hard to add. In this case, we're going to use minutes. Every degree is split up into 60 minutes. A quarter of a degree is just like a quarter of a minute. Or, <clears throat> so we can say that this is, or pardon me, a quarter of an hour. So we can say that this is 15 minutes. Then you want to follow the small little lines next to the zero and find the one that most closely matches up with an etching on the coarse scale above it and count over how many etchings that is. Here my drawing isn't very good, but let's say this happened after, oh, say on the seventh marking. We would then add seven minutes to our measurement over here. So plus seven minutes. So our total answer would be 20 degrees, 22 minutes. And this would be, a, in order to do our mathematics, this would be a little bit more than 20.34 degrees. <clears throat> You'll want to make measurements to either side of the zero of your scale in order to cancel out any systematic errors. Uh, take one measurement to either side of zero and then take the average of the two angular uh, displacements. Um, you'll notice that the arc lamps, or the, the discharge lamps are each operated by a foot pedal, so that, that will allow you to adjust things on the spectrometer with your hands while still turning the lamp on and off. Um, that's about it, and have fun.